Um, for our next session, ABC reporter Nabil al Nashar will interview the Minister for Metropolitan Roads, the Honourable Natalie Ward MP. The Minister has been a member of the Liberal Party since 1991 and served in various capacities, including on the New South Wales State Executive. And I have to say, I did spot a pic on LinkedIn the other day of the Minister with the Prime Minister of Finland, which I was absolutely fangirling over. Um, Nabil joined the ABC as their Western Sydney reporter in April of this year and mainly reports for the 7pm TV news bulletin out of the Parramatta, Parramatta Bureau. Please welcome the Minister and the Bill to the stage. All right. Thanks for uh, being here with us today. It's nice to be out in uh, Western Sydney. Of course, as mentioned earlier, I'm from Parramatta, so this is east as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to be joined uh, by uh, Minister Natalie Ward here today, Minister for Metropolitan Roads, Women's Safety and the Prevention of Domestic and Sexual Violence for the New South Wales Government. A uh, couple of hefty portfolios you've got there. Thanks, Neville. Yes, they are. I uh, like to say they're left brain and right brain. And um, it's amazing how they can dance together. It's a privilege, uh, absolute privilege to serve as a dedicated minister for women's safety and the prevention of domestic and sexual violence. And, um, you know, a government that has record funding, $484 million, uh, to almost double the number of women's shelters in New South Wales. I'll never get a front page story about that, uh, but it is a really good story and it's, a, it's something that will change lives. So I'm proud of that, together with legislative uh, reform as well, coercive control, uh, affirmative consent, uh, ensuring that we're making sure, educating young people about um, how to obtain consent uh, and uh, do what young people should do uh, in a healthy way. So there's really sufficient, uh, huge strides being made in this area. Uh, and then in roads, of course, um, you know, a $76 billion budget uh, as part of our $112 billion pipeline of infrastructure is, is massive. When I first came in, I said, what's the budget? And they said 76, I said million. They said, no, billion. Uh, so it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. And uh, when I most enjoy it is, uh, is when we get out on sites. My favourite thing is being in some work boots and a hard hat uh, out there with Camilla Drover on site and all the teams, uh, but seeing women in construction and the pathways that we have. Uh, we've put $100 million into women's safety and seeing women in construction on those sites, making them safer, more efficient, uh, more friendly and healthy for everybody on site is a fantastic thing. So an absolute joy. That's amazing. I, I'm, I had to mention that because we're also, today is the last day of 16 days of awareness yeah. for um, domestic violence. All right, you mentioned being out on sites. I wanna start with asking you, how often are you out here in Western Sydney? What kind of relationship do you have with Western Sydney? Yeah, not often enough uh, is, is, is exactly the point. And I love being out here. So I'm out uh, regularly uh, to have a look at sites, construction, um, and do sort of not just big announcements, but actually come and see for myself. The very first lesson I got in politics was go and see it for yourself. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing. Meet with people on the ground, have a look at what the infrastructure is about, have a look at what the project is, um, and go and meet with, uh, and I have on a, a number of projects, I know you'll get to it, but to meet with um, the local stakeholders, the, the developers, the people whose interest this is because local communities know what they need best. Uh, so go and listen. And, uh, and that's something I love doing. I don't want to be sitting in the office deciding things on a piece of paper and a brief. I should be out there having a look uh, for myself. And we, we do that a lot. So I'm really proud to do that. Can I do it more? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, you've been in government for more than five years now. How would you describe the rate of change Western Sydney's uh, development landscape has had since then? Monumental. Absolutely monumental. I mean, you know, the most exciting thing we see is it's not just one thing. It's not just metro, it's not just light rail, it's not just an airport, it's not just an M12, it's not just all of the local roads that go with that. Um, the Premier announced you know, a, a new school and um, $300 million for school and a selective high school. This is about a comprehensive injection to our biggest growth area, the most exciting area that we know, with West Connects delivered, you know, 40 minutes of travel time. That's not just a big project that's employed tons of people. Uh, and has now been recycled to provide a West Invest fund as well. 
but it's also the most exciting project because it's delivered for everybody um, along there's real people behind that that's families getting home faster that's your kids not sitting in the back of the car saying are we there yet um, much longer it's tradies getting to more jobs it's uh, people being able to get across the network or not use those roads if they don't want to and enjoy less congestion on Parramatta Road on their local roads so you know that transformative stuff for me is about people you know we talk about people on the roads not just you know, we talk about traffic light, 27 sets of traffic lights and 40 minutes of travel time, but I think of the family sitting behind the wheel. I think of someone wanting to get home at night after a long day. Perfect segue into my next question. Thank you. Uh, in Treasurer Matt Keane's last state budget, he emphasized that it's not just about the dollar value of the infrastructure projects, but exactly like you just said, he said it should be about the people first. Uh, he said that that's what we should keep in mind, or, or that is what we keep in mind when we come up with these projects. My question is, how's that happening? What do you think the people's needs are right now? How do you prioritize what's the next big mega infrastructure project? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it is about putting people at the center of everything we do. We are here to serve uh, the people, uh, all of you. These are your assets. These are taxpayer dollars. Uh, they belong to all of you. And putting people at the center of what we do is a real focus because that gives you your northern star to be able to guide what the priorities are. And that is about making people's lives easier. That is about getting them where they need to go across the network. It's about providing schools that are up, you know, upgraded and are local. It's about ensuring you know, 180 new and upgraded hospitals so that we have local hospitals that are fit for purpose. Um, a lot of infrastructure, $112 billion pipeline, but that's not about the big billion dollars. It's about can I get to a hospital near me? Can I get across our network quickly? Can I get home to my family? And um, I think the big issues are cost of living for families. Um, I, you know, I pay a mortgage, I have electricity bills, I know what it's like for families to, to deal with those challenges. Um, and we want to be able to put more money back in the pockets of people to make their own decisions about what they want to do. Um, but that goes hand in hand with big infrastructure. I'm proud to be part of a government that's over successive elections has taken those hard decisions. I mean, a few of you might be old enough like me to remember the poles and wires election. You know, we're about to go into an election. That was a really tough election about what to do with poles and wires. But getting that mandate in that election allowed us to build West Connex. And building West Connex has changed lives. Then doing recycling the West Connect asset has provided a $5 billion fund for West Invest, absolutely focused on Western Sydney uh, and local roads. So I think those transformative things, big dollars, changing people's lives. All right, let's get into some people's lives. I want to talk about specific examples. Yep. Austral, Oran Park, Gregory Hills are a few examples of the government promising new suburbs with new opportunities cheaper housing, space to grow for Australian families, but time and again, after people you know, put their life savings into moving there, uh, buying or building new homes, um, they find a devastating lack of infrastructure, uh, lack of public schools or high schools, no local parks, um, proper roads or train stations, sometimes even no sewerage. Um, do you think the government sometimes bites off a bit more than it could chew with when it comes to catching up with the infrastructure to the urban sprawl? Yeah, and that's what you do when you're ambitious. And, um, you know, it is tough to deliver massive amounts of infrastructure, schools, roads, growth areas, support growth, um, and do it all at once. It's impossible to do it all at once. Uh, and I accept that. I was out at Wallandilly yesterday and we were talking about sewerage uh, there and um, a very active local member. Uh, but it, it is about those things. But when you have an ambitious plan, when you are looking at all of New South Wales, when you're looking at... Um, and it's no excuse, but what we've been through with floods recently has set back uh, a lot of the timelines. But nonetheless, we're ambitious to do these things. We have a Minister for Homes. We're looking at planning. We have a $300 million fund to look at how we can invest in getting that planning. And many of you um, from councils working closely with us on how we can streamline those planning processes is critically important. Um, identifying and working with local communities on some of those issues, you know, really pulling that infrastructure through quickly, it's complex, um, but that's not a reason not to do it or not to focus on how we need to deliver that quickly and efficiently for those families. Um, and we know that we are actively supporting Western Sydney as a, the biggest growth area, uh, but we want people to be able to work, play, raise a family uh, locally without having to travel an hour and a half to Sydney to do it. And you know, we want to create all of those opportunities. So that's, you know, as former sports minister, that's sporting opportunities, it's schools, it's education, it's transport links, it's making sure we have all of that. But we're 
we're quite you know, clear that we have this view and this vision and a plan uh, for New South Wales going forward, which is not just about us and now, it's about the next generation and our children's children. Um, and that ambitious plan comes with some timeline issues. Um, and, but we, we won't shy away from the fact that we need to provide more housing, we need to provide the infrastructure that goes around it. Uh, and, and I'm proud to be part of a government that is bold and has a vision and wants to uh, work with communities to make sure we're delivering that. All right, we've had a lot of talk today about uh, West Connex, uh, Parramatta Light Rail, a lot of these infrastructure projects, but we haven't always had the best track record when it comes to delivering mega projects like this on budget and on time. How are you feeling about the M12, which for those who don't know, will be the main artery connecting Western Sydney Airport to the rest of Sydney? Yeah, M12 is fantastic. I mean, M12 has to happen. We're going to have a third Sydney airport. It's going to be amazing. We will have freight going in there. It will be um, a huge jobs, it already is, a massive jobs crash and um, opportunity. Uh, it will be uh, what we need in New South Wales to ensure that freight's getting across. We saw in COVID how critical that was. So the M12 must happen there. Uh, and that connection, as you know, M7, M12, um, Northern Road, Elizabeth Drive, um, has to happen to get that freight through. And I'm pleased that we've partnered with the federal government um, to deliver that. But uh, And that will be toll free, of course. Uh, but it's, you know, I went to see Catherine King about that immediately um, after the election and said, this is our shared priority, this has to happen. Um, and so I'm confident that we've also, of course, got the Metro going out there. Um, and so delivering all of those things, it would be very easy to sit back and do one thing. That would be the easier political option. That, would, uh, that wouldn't offend anybody, but it wouldn't get anything done. And so ensuring that we are doing Metro, we're providing the lines out there, we've got the freight lines. We need, I know we need to look at the local roads more carefully uh, and prioritise those. They are big, complex projects, but we are doing so much at once uh, with the Aerotropolis, with the Bradfield area, with um, the upgrades that we've done for Northern Road, um, Mamre Road, all of the others that need to go with that. It's a, it is biting off a big chunk, but I'm, I'm proud that we can be ambitious about that because we know that that airport is coming. It looks amazing uh, and the M12 will be that vital freight corridor through there. Same question, but 15th Avenue, which is gonna be the road connecting Bradfield City to Liverpool and via that the rest of Western Sydney. How, how strong are you feeling about it? Uh, being there and ready before 2026? Well, we, we have to deliver these. So the fact is that um, more cash injection, I'll just do a plug here, more, more cash from the federal government would make things happen faster. Uh, and you know, I'm being a, a pretty annoying advocate on that front to say these are our shared priorities. These things have to happen. Uh, and so to get out there and, and be energetic and say we want to deliver these, I would love to deliver them early. Um, but for our part, if we're a government that has a track record of delivering. North Connects was, you know, on time on budget. We know that we can demonstrate and point to what we have done. But when looking to the future, we want to be able to say that partnering with the federal government to deliver these, a lot of work at the same time, uh, means that we can provide those outcomes faster. Is it going to be perfect? No. Are we absolutely committed to it? Yes. Will we make it happen? Um, you know, there's some complexity around delivering so much at one time, particularly with um, supply issues, labour costs, um, global supply chain issues. But um, we won't shy away from that. We've got smart heads working together on how we can bring those things through. But more money would help. I bet. You mentioned earlier uh, flood recovery. So let's talk about that a little bit. Flood after flood after flood uh, in a very short space of time. Uh, residents in the areas affected by the floods uh, have sort of been living in a Groundhog Day experience of a cycle of destruction, cleanup, rebuild. Is there a way uh, we could plan or have better infrastructure in the way we build our roads uh, to mitigate some of this flood damage so it doesn't keep happening? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, we're looking at, so we have 100 projects that we're looking at prioritising, um, Hawkesbury and the Pen, obviously, um, and throughout the state about how we can better plan and work together with communities to identify those. I think there's something that's probably not finalised yet, but on looking at low points in roads and literally getting locals to identify those low points so we can... I believe just over 15 roads have been identified thus far? Thereabouts. Um, I'm sure there's probably more, but uh, yeah, smarter planning on some of those things and identifying the fact that we've had flood after flood after flood tells us uh, that sometimes, you know, we need to do better on that planning and not just patch it up. And of course, that leads me to my favourite topic that I know more about than I ever thought I would, which is potholes. 
um, you know, pot <laughs> I now know a lot about potholes. Um, and, you know, that is a huge challenge for us on every single road. I mean, I bet every single person in this room knows a pothole on a local road uh, that is bothering them. So um, the great solution is ring 131 700, uh, 131 700, where you can direct that through. But these are priority issues. Why? Because they're really annoying and it's your road and you pay for it. What's been great about that solution and what we're looking at with the low points is uh, innovative solutions. So we now have a thing called cold mix. Um, you used to not be able to fix potholes uh, until it dried out. So it's like painting a wet wall. You can't do it, you've got to wait for it to dry. Now we've got this cold mix which loves water. It will absorb it, fill it, it's longer standing. So we're looking at innovative ways we can get to those more quickly. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it's those solutions longer term that bring out the best ideas and that's what we want to embrace with innovation in these things. So we are working on that, something to, to mitigate the, the damage and the risk from happening in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, earlier today, the Premier said that the people of Western Sydney are happier than the people of Lane Cove. Do you believe that? I, don't, I, don't, I agree with what he said. <laughs> Whatever the boss said, I agree with. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, he also listed multiple government initiatives. Uh, chief among them is the West Invest Fund, which you talked about earlier as well. Now, I've spoken to Western Sydney residents, and some of them think the West Invest Fund is an apology for what they went through during the pandemic's disproportionate lockdowns. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, I was um, Minister for Multiculturalism uh, at the time of the lockdowns and Minister for Sport. Uh, and so I was pretty closely working with communities um, during that time and um, what I knew we needed to do was work with each community closely to understand um, the challenges for them um, and yeah it was a tough time it was a tough time for everybody it was a tough time to understand um, you know what we had to do to keep people safe um, and I was equally chasing Brad Hazard down the hallways uh, to see how we could get things opened up again and uh, particularly for sport you know the mental health the component of communities coming together um, you know, across socio-economic age, um, social inclusion, they were really important things for people at the time. It wasn't just about sport, it was about community. Um, so I learnt a lot about, a lot about the importance. Um, people need people. Um, people want to be together in communities. Uh, but in terms of West Invest, uh, I think it's always been a fiscal uh, responsibility. We are a responsible government. And uh, as I said, we, we went to an election on Poles and Wires, we turned that into West Connects, we turned that into West Invest. So we have a $5 billion self-sufficient fund. We've actually been the well-behaved child, if you like, because we've been self-sufficient. That is your money, that are your dollars, your assets, to turn that into West Invest. And that's been a long-term proposition. So that hasn't just come out of the pandemic, with respect, that's come out of long-term planning for how do we self-sufficiently recycle these assets to provide more for communities, which is exactly what we should be doing. And West Invest is exciting for me because it's local. It's all local. It's working with councils. It's working with local communities, listening to what you need uh, and what we can do in that, in that local area. So out of these big things has come fantastic local issues. Um, I'm really proud of, proud of that, uh, and I wish the federal government would recognise that a bit. Fair enough. So not an apology. Um, of course, I couldn't let you go without asking uh, about this. You've lost the pre-selection for Davidson. Uh, you've congratulated Matt Cross on winning the safest liberal seat in North Shore, a seat that was kind of earmarked for you. You can't be too happy about that. Um, do you feel like you were maybe robbed? Uh, I feel, um, I don't think people really care about internal Liberal Party issues. I think they care about um, what we're doing for them. And every single day, I am humbled. I'm just so privileged to work for uh, the people of New South Wales. It's a, you know, I wake up and think this is the best job in the world. I get to help people and do good things. And that's what this government's about. And we're absolutely focused on delivering for people in New South Wales, for families, making it easier. Um, a targeting cost of living, making sure we're delivering on our pipeline of infrastructure, making sure we're building schools, making sure that we understand the needs of every single community, which differs really enormously. Uh, and the privilege I have of working in women's safety uh, and seeing you know, that we are providing safe spaces for women and their children um, and we're saving lives through legislation is what I'm singularly focused on. And uh, every day I love doing that. So I think that's what people are interested in. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of women, uh, there are now 10 women uh, in the government. Uh, how do you feel about female representation in the New South Wales government right now? Do you feel like there could be more? 
I think we need more um, diversity across our parliaments. Uh, I'd like to see more cold communities represented, more multiculturalism in our parliament. Uh, I'd like to see, of course, more women. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's important that we represent our communities and we listen to uh, what they want to see and hear. Uh, and uh, I'll always be focused on that and I'll always be um, encouraging people to put their hands up. And um, that's maybe why I have a bit of a go, because I thought if I'm telling everybody else to do it, I should probably do it too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've got to walk the talk. But I, I think it's really important that we are open to more diversity. We encourage that. We're a bit better at uh, being child-friendly now. You can take a child on the floor of the parliament, uh, which is great. And Scott Barrett was giving a speech, and his uh, two-year-old son was in the chamber, and he ran up to him, which would have been a terrible no-no a few years ago. So that kind of stuff, being more family-friendly, um, keeping our hours a bit more sensible, makes for better outcomes. Uh, it makes for better decision-making. It makes for... Uh, better views uh, being put forward. Uh, I, I, you know, I love that. I would welcome more people joining us in there. So um, if you're thinking about it, put your hand up. Well, it is election season and everybody's in campaign mode. Last question. Uh, are you worried at all that female representation might hurt you at the next elections? I'm raring to go. Uh, this is a government. I, I love campaigning. I love elections. I love the contest of ideas. We have bold visions. Uh, we're about the next generation. We're energised. We're ready to go. But our budget was all about women. Our budget was absolutely focused, and you saw Matt Keane and the team, completely focused on women's economic participation, providing universal pre-kinder provides that, I wish I'd had that when I had kids, um, when, when my kids were younger. Uh, that provides the opportunity, if you would like to, to participate in the workforce, we will cover that year of pre-kindergarten. $100 million in women's safety, for me, was magnificent because it meant that we could provide more of those measures to keep women safe at work, um, provide respectful places, down to things like safe um, Parramatta Park, you know, providing lighting and CCTV so when you're coming out of the train station, you can get across to your car without worrying about walking through a dark park where there was sadly a tragedy many years ago. So, you know, those things demonstrate our commitment to women, uh, to uh, a government that is focused on ensuring that we are including everybody in our population, but we're thinking about how women should be included and how we can back that in, not just with nice statements or nice legislation, but actually funding that to happen. Uh, and in my space in Women's Refuges, you know, record funding is an absolute demonstration of our commitment uh, to women, to keeping us safe, and, and that's better for communities. Uh, so I'm really excited by that. Amazing. I could easily turn this into an hour-long interview, but Chris Brown's about to kick me off the stage. So, <laughs> Minister Ward, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Great you. to see you. Thank you.